chapter 3, only a couple more Sundays and we'll uh, go on to a, another book, but uh, I've been enjoying uh, just considering how the Lord warns us ahead of time of the dangers that, that are there. Um, you know, he's, he's warned us that there's, there's going to be uh, false teachers, uh, there's going to be those who will scoff at what we believe, and in uh, looking at chapter 3, he, he, uh, he gives us some things that we need to be aware of to have answers when the scoffers come. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, he says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Uh, just stop reading there. You know, scoffers believe God is nothing. Uh, they, many of them don't believe God even, even exists. And the, the things they pose here, they're saying, well, I guess they'd be saying, if there is a God, He doesn't keep His promises. Where is the promise of His coming? Uh, if there is a God, He can't really change anything. All things continue as they were uh, from the beginning. But you know, the number one test of anything is, is it true? Uh, that's, that's a real key to life. Is it true? You know, somebody can, anybody can say anything to you. Is it true? That's the first question you need to ask yourself. And the truth is, God is everything. God is everything. Uh, he changes what He chooses to change. And no one can stop Him. <laughs> he always keeps His promises. God cannot lie. And uh, in, in looking at this subject tonight, answering the scoffers, part of that's for them. You know, scoffers need to hear that there are answers, but it's especially for us. We need to know that there's answers. Uh, these verses are written for Christians. You know, he, he writes there in verse 1, uh, Beloved, I now write unto you. Uh, in verse uh, 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Uh, verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, and so on. He, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to us. We need to have answers. We need to understand that when people scoff God and His Word and uh, the Bible and, and so on, uh, that, that God knew that was going to happen and has equipped us to, to deal with it. Last week, we looked at some of the reasons that we believe. and uh, The first one is in verses 1 and 2, and that's the Scripture. Verse 2, when he says, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, you know, the Old Testament, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, the New Testament. You know, God has given us His Word. Uh, that's... That's the main reason we believe. God has revealed the truth to us. The other is history. It's interesting. Uh, the world tries to take history away from us. Listen, we have the book written by the person who was there when it began. We have the only eyewitness account of creation. And uh, the thing we can ask them when they talk, you know, uh, you have to laugh. They'll, they'll talk about a million years, a billion years. The question we ask them is, were you there? One man was a, a guide at a, a museum, and he would tell people, now this, uh, this represents an animal that's 5 billion, 20 years old. They'd say, well, man, how can you be so accurate? He said, well, when I started working here, it was 5 billion years old, and I've been working here 20 years, so <laughs> must be 5 billion, 20 years old. <laughs> you know, they, they throw around time like it's, like it's nothing. Um, and they particularly like to pick on creation and the flood. And that's what verses 5 and 6 are about. They're willingly ignorant of it, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. You know, God created the heavens and the earth, and He's the only one who was there. Uh, the flood, in verse 6, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. We talked about that last week, how that, you know, they find fossils of fish on tops of mountains. Uh, the, the flood... You know, these, these things that they say take millions of years, God did it in, in just a, a very short time. Things like the Grand Canyon, it didn't take a long time. Uh, there was a, a, a volcano that went off in the state in America where my parents lived, and boom, just within a few days, there was a miniature Grand Canyon, because that's how it works. You know, God, God's flood uh, made a big difference to our world. Um, and let me say, there's no reason to be ignorant about creation and the flood. There is plenty of information 
Uh, there's a website called creation.com. You know, they made it really easy, <laughs> creation.com. Just about any question you have or anybody has, uh, they'll have a Bible answer for it and, and written by scientists. Tonight, we want to look at three more reasons that we believe God. And uh, those have to do with God's nature, God's character, and God's promises. They all, they all slot in together. Let's read in 2 Peter 3 in verse 8 now. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. We just stop, stop reading there for the moment. Uh, these three things. The first one is, is God's nature. That's what verse 8 is about. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. This is not a mathematical formula to try and figure things out. He's just saying that God is eternal. That God is outside of time. Time is on our side as Bible believers, by the way. Uh, uh, you know, you might think a thousand years is a long time. Um, like I said, the evolutionists, they throw that around like that's, that's nothing. Or we might think a thousand years is nothing, you know. But God's not limited by that. And that's, that's what it's saying. God is eternal. When, uh, when we talk about uh, Jesus coming, you know, God gave all these different prophecies. And the Bible says in the fullness of time, Jesus came in God's time. And with the second coming, that's the thing he brings up here that people were mocking at that time. Where is the promise of his coming? Man, it's been 20 years <laughs> at that time. Well, now it's been a lot longer. And still, you know, we look for his coming and we know he's coming. But when the disciples ask, you know, when are you going to set up your kingdom? He said, that's not for you to know the times of the seasons. That's in God's hands. And uh, God knows the time. Uh, God is not limited by time. You know, one, some of the things that God says about himself, for instance, in Revelation 1, verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. You know, he's, he's past, present, and future. He's called the great I Am. God exists in the present. <laughs> God is here. God is here. And uh, we need to understand, he, he and his nature uh, do not change. Let me read you a couple of verses. Uh, Psalm 102, verse 27. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today, and forever. Uh, James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God doesn't change. Uh, time doesn't change him. Uh, God's nature doesn't change. You know, we use some, some big words to describe God. Uh, God is omnipresent. That means he is everywhere present at once. Now, you and I can only be in one place at a time other than when we get on the phone. You know, we can talk to somebody somewhere else, but we're not actually there. <laughs> All right? And uh, man has, has not worked that out. Uh, God is everywhere present. People are only one, in one place. We're limited. God has all power. There's a real interesting word that we read there in verse 10 where it says the elements shall melt. Interesting, in verse 11, the word dissolve is exactly the same Greek word. Dissolve, melt. It means to untie or loosen. See, the world is held together by the word of his And someday God is going to untie it. <laughs> yeah, man, we, we think we're so powerful. God... It, the, the scientists talk about things like dark matter and things like that. Have you ever read about it? it it's almost comical. They have no evidence for it, but they know it's there. <laughs> uh, well, I think what they're looking for is the power of God. And God is someday just going to untie our universe. He holds it together by the, by the word of his power. Uh, he has all power. He knows everything. Did you ever realize God never... Nothing ever occurred to God. <laughs> he already knows. 
Uh, he knows about you. He knows about your moments and your days. Yeah, when we're praying, we're not informing God. We're, we're praying. We're asking. We're talking to him. We're communicating. And one of the main things we're looking at here is God is eternal and unchanging. He has no beginning. He has no end. And the way this affects us is we live with hope because of this. Uh, Romans chapter 15 and, and, and verse 14, he says, I myself also am persuaded, verse 4, let me get the right words, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. God gave us the Bible so that we can have hope. That's how we know about God. God's revealed himself. We don't know about God by cleverly thinking about something. The Bible is not man's words about God. The Bible is God's word to man. We need to understand that. God revealed himself to us. And by faith, as God has written, we can have comfort of the, we can, through patience and comfort of the scripture, have hope. Earlier in Romans 10, verse 17, he says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The reason we can have faith is because God has spoken. And if you don't believe that, you don't really have faith. That's, that's important. Our faith needs to be in God. God's nature is that he is eternal, that he's omnipotent and omnipresent and all of these things that, uh, that make up who God, God is. He's eternal and unchanging. And really, you can't understand life or the universe without believing the truth about the nature of God. That's the problem with science today. It's come to a dead end. It's doing all kinds of, of foolish things because they've left reason behind. They've left faith behind. God has his timing. God has his timing. And you know what? Because he's God, he has the right to that. He had the right to decide when Jesus would come. And he has the right to decide when Jesus will come again. Uh, but he'll fulfill his promise. As well, because he's God, he has the ability to perform that. Jesus came. You know, you read through the Old Testament, and the, the idea of Jesus coming, uh, it, it couldn't have worked out by chance. You can see the devil trying to stop him and all of the things that had to happen for Jesus to be born uh, of, of David and uh, all the different prophecies that, that God had given. Uh, Jesus came in, in God's time and in God's way. And Jesus will come again in exactly that same way. Uh, in Galatians 4, he says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman. God's time when Jesus came. In Ephesians 1, verse 10, he says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, what he's saying there is Jesus coming again is going to be in the dispensation of the fullness of times, when God decides. In Acts chapter 1, he says, When they therefore come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Uh, God has the right to decide uh, the time of things. And we need to understand the nature of God. Our God is eternal. And uh, that gives us hope. Uh, he doesn't have a bad day. He doesn't say, Oh, I don't, I don't like Jason today. Uh, I'm, I'm tired of Edmund today. No. Uh, he says, I love you with an eternal love. And his compassion, his, his mercies don't fail. They're, they're new every morning. You know, he, he, unending resources that we, we rely on. We need to understand the nature of God. And it ties very closely with the second thing. We need to understand the character of God. There in 2 Peter 3 and, and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. You hear this accusation against God quite frequently, to be honest with you. Oh, well, if there's really a God, why does, and, and they name their, their, situ, their pet situation. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, God is faithful. God is faithful. 
They've been uh, talking a lot in the news this week about landing on the moon. Listen, you can't land on the moon if you don't have a faithful universe. And you don't have a faithful universe unless you have a faithful God. They can figure out where things are going to be that are a million miles away, when they're going to be there, and you know, they, they can mathematically figure it out. Our universe runs like a clock because our God is faithful. He's not slack. And the Bible says he is long-suffering. He's not vindictive. God is not looking to punish us. He's looking to show mercy. And, and he went way out of his way to do it. Uh, Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? You know, we look at our world and we say, Oh, how could there be such wickedness if there's a good God? Well, listen, those wicked people are just like you and just like me. And God is long-suffering to them just like he is to you. Now, I don't know how you are, but uh, there's times when I don't do the right thing. You didn't know that, did you? You mean pastor is not perfect? <laughs> My wife knows that. <laughs> My kids know that. Yeah, you know that. Uh, yeah, God is long-suffering to all of us. And, uh, you know, these people, we, you know, it's easy to point the finger at someone else. But listen, God shows them mercy just like he shows you mercy. And God is long-suffering to them just like he is to you. And what a wonderful God we have. His character doesn't change. You know, on the one hand, God is loving and merciful and long-suffering. But you know what? God is also holy and just and righteous. And the only way that works is in Jesus Christ. God can be both loving and holy. God can be both merciful and just, both long-suffering and righteous in Christ. What's the, the psalm? Is it justice and mercy of kissed? One of those. Uh, it's in Christ that justice and mercy meet. Because when we deserve justice, he gave us mercy. He took our place. Now, the character of God, he extends his mercy and his love, but judgment will come. Because he's faithful, uh, because uh, he, he's always true, we can count on his mercy, but we can know if, if we reject his mercy, we will receive judgment. Uh, God said before the flood, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Man, that's, uh, that's a dangerous warning when it comes from God. My spirit will not always strive with man. And sure enough, uh, only Noah and his family uh, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, amazing that they were the only ones who were willing to live for God. In uh, Romans chapter 9, 22, this is an interesting verse. He says, What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. <clears throat> Interesting verse. He's saying, there's people God knows are not going to trust him and are going to go to hell. But God still shows them mercy until their time of judgment. The next part of the verse says, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. And God knows those that will trust him and those that he'll, he's going to take to heaven, but he still shows them mercy and, and still extends. He doesn't just take us straight to heaven when we get saved, put it that way. Uh, God gives us a certain amount of time, and what we do with our time and what we do with the Lord is between us and God. You know, I wish there was some way I could save somebody. You know, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if there was something you could do to make somebody else go to heaven? But you can't. Someone has said, God doesn't have any grandchildren. And it's true. You have to be a child of God. You have to trust Christ. You can be a pastor's son and die and go to hell. Well, what a tragedy that would be. You can have parents that are godly people and never trust their God. You know, a lot of people have cultural Christianity. It's been more common in the past. It, it, it's dying out. But uh, yeah, some people just have a cultural Christianity. They have a culture in their family and in their, in their group of people that they know that is Christian. But they've never trusted Christ as their personal Savior. 
Uh, we can count on the character of God. But you know, that goes both ways. We can count on His love and His mercy and His, his, uh, his long-suffering, but we can also count on His holiness and justice and righteousness. Uh, there's coming a day of judgment. Uh, this passage in 2 Peter, the scoffer's argument was about Jesus coming again. Where is the promise of His coming? And one of the things they were willingly ignorant of is that when Jesus does come again, it's going to be a time of judgment. The Bible makes that very clear. You know, for the Christians, we'll, we'll be snatched out ahead of time. But uh, you know, for the world, when Jesus comes again, the second coming, it's, it's not a, a pretty time. It's a time of judgment. And it's going to be, uh, it's going to be some difficult times for, for people when they stand before God and, and give an account. Uh, when people scoff, they need to consider uh, the nature of God. Uh, God is eternal. Time is, is not a problem to Him. Uh, they need to consider the character of God. Uh, it, it's unchanging. Uh, it's set. Uh, it's, it's holy and pure. We point them to God's nature and to God's character. And part of that is with, as well, we point them to the promises of God. Verse 10, he says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord will come. The day of the Lord talks about judgment. The day of the Lord will come. Then he says, as a thief in the night. Most thieves don't write you a note and say, I'm coming Tuesday night at midnight. <laughs> they come when you least expect it. <laughs> at least that's their hope. Uh, and he's just using that as an illustration. God's not telling us exactly when he's coming. He says, I'm coming. And that's his promise. Scoffers today are like the people who mocked Noah. You know, they would have said, yeah, where's this flood you're, you're talking about? And, and the amazing thing is, if they would have believed him, they would have been saved. I think I mentioned uh, the Van Komen's daughter wrote a, uh, did a reading about the boy who almost went. And she just made it up about a young man thinking about what Noah was saying and deciding, should I get on the ark or not? And he decided not. And he drowned and he went to hell. You know, it's the same today. When people mock God's word and say, where is the promise of his coming? What they're being willingly ignorant of is that when Jesus comes again, he's going to judge them for that very scoffing and mocking and rejection. They, they need the Lord. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5 and uh, verse 1, He says, of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they, they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. God says, Jesus is coming again. Now, like we read here in, in 2 Peter, the day of the Lord will come. And over and over, we can point people to the promises of God in Scripture. We can point them to, to the prophecies of Jesus' first coming, the prophecies of Jesus' second coming, uh, the doctrine of who God is and, and what He's like, uh, the revelation uh, of, the, of the Scripture. Uh, you know, we see many things that, that we believe and that we can share with, with scoffers. But, you know, our main arguments are the Word of God and the love of God. The love of God, I'm talking about Jesus. And we need to be careful. We don't need to be afraid to argue with people. We do need to be kind. But share with them God's Word. Use God's words. What I'm saying is, use the, when you're talking to people about eternal truths, use the actual words of God. Don't just get into a slanging match with them, an argument with them. Let that flow over you. Read the Gospels and see how Jesus responded. You know, you don't, you're not obliged to answer people's questions. <laughs> Just tell them what you want to tell them. Uh, there's a well-known pastor who's in, in the United States who often goes on these national TV shows. And somebody asked him, how do you do so? He does really well, you know, talking on them. They said, how do you do so well in there? He said, well, I just go on there and I decide ahead of time what I'm going to say. He said, I just ignore what their questions and what they're talking about, and I just tell them what they need to hear. <laughs> and, you know, uh, we don't have to answer people's questions. What they need to hear is what God has to say. Use God's word. Listen, if you have a lion, 
You don't have to spend a lot of time defending it or trying to prove that it exists. Just turn it loose. <laughs> and that's what we have in the Word of God. Just turn it loose. Let some scripture go on them and let God work on them. Listen, if, if God can't change their mind, you and I certainly aren't going to. The Holy Spirit can't do it. You and I aren't going to do it. We need, they need to hear God's word. Use the actual <laughs> words of God. And then secondly, live the word of God. You know, Christian kindness goes a long way. Uh, I, I know every one of us have times when we're cranky. Uh, we all do. Man, I got home from camp. I was cranky. <laughs> you know, I was tired. But, uh, you know, that does, that's no excuse, is it? And as Christians, we need to be kind to people. Even people who mock us. Uh, even people who, who scorn uh, our Lord. In, uh, in 2 uh, Peter chapter 3 and, and verse uh, 2, he says that you may be mindful. We need to be mindful. God has said scoffers will come. It shouldn't surprise us when people disagree with us and treat us scornfully. Uh, a good way to stay humble is this. Every once in a while, go door knocking, asking people if they would like to come to church. Just do that every once in a while. That'll keep you humble. Uh, has, has, it's helped me a lot. Uh, you know, people can treat you like dirt. But that's okay. They treated Jesus the same way. Uh, God told us that that would happen. But he also told us judgment will come. And so we have a heart for these people. The Bible says that people who don't know the Lord oppose themselves. Isn't that a funny team? We're on their side and they're against themselves. <laughs> Uh, we need to have a heart for people. Uh, verse 10, he says, the day of the Lord will come. Uh, the Bible says we have a precious faith, but it's not so precious we can't give it away. It's so precious that the more you give it away, the more precious it'll be to you. That's how he described it in 2 Peter 1 and verse 1. Uh, in uh, chapter 3 and verse 11, here's the application. He says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Listen, this world is going to melt. God's going to untie it. It's going to, it's going to be gone. What kind of person should you be? Verse um, 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Be diligent. Be mindful. Then in, in verses 17 and 18, he says, therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Don't be caught up in the scoffing, in the mocking. You know, when evolution first came out, Christians didn't know what to think. And they tried to adapt things and so on. Listen, we don't have to worry. Science, I can guarantee you, they don't use the same science book they used when I was in school. But we're still using the same book that God wrote. Uh, they'll keep changing their tune. We can keep singing the same old tune. And that's, uh, that's trusting the Lord. Uh, beware. And then he says in verse 18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's the key. Keep growing. Keep growing closer, closer to the Lord. Let me ask you, are you growing? If you're saved, are you growing? Uh, are you planning on it? What are you doing uh, to keep growing? If you're not planning on it, you probably won't. So let me encourage you. God tells us here, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Don't even do it for yourself. Do it for the glory of the Lord. And then, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? Or are you one of these that He calls scorners? Are you one who scorned His grace and think, oh, I'll be right. I've been good enough. Have you come to repentance, like he says there at the end of verse 9, but that all should come to repentance? You know, there's, there's people who went out into eternity today who didn't expect to. Every day that happens to somebody, probably many. God gives however much time we have. You need to trust him. The Bible says, while it's called today. We may not have tomorrow. God holds on to tomorrow. Now, let's go to him in, in prayer this evening. Um, with our heads bowed and in, in an attitude of, of prayer, uh, there's a lot of difficulties in life. There's a lot of curly questions that people ask. But you know, we can still trust the Lord. And uh, we can know that he is true, that he has the answer.
Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Help us, Lord, to understand how to live the Christian life and, uh, Lord, how to be uh, what we should be uh, to those around us who uh, have scoffed at you and, and your word. Help us to be able to share your word and your love with them in a way that they might be turned around and come to you. God, help us. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your word tonight. Thank you that we can know that we have the truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.